So thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me uh, about this important topic. I know you are uh, an advocate of uh, evidence-based uh, HR and evidence-based management, and uh, I hope uh, what we are doing will help promote that from this side of the world as well, uh, as we share yeah. the content that you that we are going to produce. Uh, already, even in Zimbabwe, people are already talking about evidence-based management and citing the, the last presentation that you did for us. So I just thought today, let me just ask you a few questions. Uh, sure. Then we, we package that and share. Thank you. Okay. So uh, my first question is, uh, what is evidence-based HR? I know there are others who have said there's nothing like that. There are others who don't believe in science. How do you define evidence-based HR? Uh, evidence-based HR is really just the same as evidence-based practice in any field. It's about using multiple sources of evidence and types of evidence in order to understand firstly what the problem or issue or opportunity is. And then once you've identified one, if there is one, then you use, again, multiple sources of evidence, including scientific evidence, to try and identify a likely solution or intervention. So in a sense, it's just really... Uh, informed decision making that's all it is really okay i know you've done a number of initiatives around the issue of evidence-based hr have you been successful how would you measure your success what is the status the state of evidence-based hr when you look at the global market yeah that's a great question so of course one of the challenges is hr always uses evidence but simply using evidence is not the same as evidence-based practice because we always use evidence. So the development of evidence-based HR, there's been some developments, I guess, within the Center for Evidence-Based Management. So there's more courses now being taught at universities, for example. A book came out from the center. But if you said, what evidence do I have that HR is being more evidence-based than it was, say, 10 years ago, it's not very clear to me that it is. So I think in terms of awareness, I think more HR practitioners are vaguely aware of the idea of evidence-based HR. I think not many practitioners do it, partly mm -hmm. because they don't know what it is, and partly because I think there are a lot of barriers and things that get in the way of being an evidence-based HR practitioner. So I think there's a little more knowledge, a little more awareness, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it's something that's being done a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, John Sullivan, quote, uh, uh, in one of his articles, uh, he was saying that Gallup uh, did uh, some form of analysis and found that uh, recruitment is the greatest impact on business performance of all HR processes. Have we come across this kind of evidence? Uh, and if not, what, what, which areas would you put in the top five or top three? in terms of the impact on the business? I think that's a, it's, a, it, it's an attractive question, memory. It's a sort of attractive question. But I think that's what, it's one that is impossible to answer mm -hmm. because I think different businesses, different organizations are in different contexts. There are different points in their life cycles. They have different strategies. So the things HR can do to make most difference would depend a lot on those other things, the context, the goals of the organization, what is already happening, the labor market, all kinds of things. So I think it's impossible. And quite often, um, I guess that there is a temptation to identify, you know, the one thing, what's the most important thing HR can do. And in general, the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on the situation and circumstance. So I would say HR can be very important, but it, what it does, how important it is, depends on the setting and the context. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is on uh, something that we are also struggling with here in terms of uh, um, HR and psychology. Uh, and yeah. uh, David Guest uh, 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 talked about the psychologization of HR. What's your take yeah. on that? Well, for example, when I look at the situations here, there are people who think psychology is taking over from HR, uh, when the HR degree came a bit later, psychology was old enough to, to take over and all these things. So there is a, a bit of conflict sometimes even in our own conferences here. 
What have you seen on the ground? And do you agree with depth guests? Yeah, so I think it depends. Again, it depends what you think HR is. Um, but mm -hmm. one way of understanding what HR is, it's about lots of things. But its fundamental role is around shaping and changing human behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps not surprising that there is a lot of psychologization of HR, because obviously psychology and behavioral science and related disciplines are concerned with trying to understand and predict and influence behavior in different circumstances. So I'm not surprised. I think the main uh, challenge with it is that often this psychologicalization assumes that a lot of the psychology evidence is good when it may not be. And mm -hmm. also IO psychology, industrial psychology, organizational psychology tends to be very individually based. So it tends to look at things about the person, internal things like their personality, and their attitudes, for example, as predictors of behavior, and therefore things you have to intervene in. So psychology is not so good at, uh, which it could be better at, thinking about group processes, uh, institutional processes, other things that we also know shape behavior. So while psychology might be important, you could argue disciplines such as sociology, anthropology, perhaps even political science, also have a role to play in understanding behavior at work so i think psychology certainly has a role and it, but it depends partly what you think hr is for in terms of changing human behavior but also where the psychology needs also other disciplines we need other disciplines not just psychology to help us understand behavior at work thank, thank you very much for that clarification my next question is uh, what would you say is the set of hr theory in general and the empirical evidence to guide practitioners. Do we have enough empirical evidence in the field of HR to be able to guide the uh, uh, HR practice? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a great question again, memory. So I think I think an ideal situation is when HR practitioner is trying to make a decision, they look around for evidence, they find lots of evidence in their organization, they find lots of really good scientific evidence, they have a lot of ex experience from their expertise and they have lots of evidence from stakeholders. So four sources of evidence and they're all very clear and it's good quality and they're all pointing in the same direction. That's just never going to happen or it's very unlikely to happen. So typically we have limited evidence. We have evidence of different qualities. We have evidence that's more or less relevant to the thing we're dealing with. So there's an ideal which will never happen. And then there's the more realistic thing. So I think in terms of your question was, do we have enough evidence? I would say evidence-based practice is not about whether we have enough evidence or too much evidence or the right amount of evidence. Evidence-based practice is a process. It's about trying to make a more informed decision. So in a way, it doesn't matter if we have lots of good evidence or not so much evidence. The point is, did we go through a process of trying to make the most informed decision we could given the evidence that was available to us at that time or the evidence we collected. So mm -hmm. I think to me, rather than focusing on do we have enough evidence, I would say the issue is did we stick to and go through a process that allowed us to make a more informed decision? And if we did, that's the point of evidence-based practice. Then thank you very much. Thank you. Now I want to go into specific areas. Uh, maybe you can uh, share it. Uh, um, more general level, more the average level in terms of what works, what doesn't. I know yeah. that, uh, I was watching your YouTube uh, video on employee engagement uh, and yeah. uh, just reading some of the claims that it can lead to all these things like Gallup. I was reading yes. there, they, they call their meta analytic study in a way they were claiming a lot of things there. So, what, what, what is the general comment around the issue of employee engagement? This impact, I think. Uh... Again, I think I'm this might be a frustrating answer for you and your listeners, but the mm -hmm. answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, even if you can define engagement clearly, which in my view you can't, and even if you can measure it in a valid and reliable way, which I'm not so sure you can, mm -hmm. the question is, does it say affect performance? And the other question is, even if it does, can you intervene to change engagement? There are probably circumstances in which you can. Uh, there are also circumstances in which you can't. There are probably circumstances under which 
engagement, whatever that means, plays quite a large role in performance. And there's probably other circumstances where it just doesn't matter very much for performance. Mm -hmm. So in terms of engagement as an example, I would, and it applies to think any uh, concept, any intervention, it's very much around the situation you're in. So the other question you started off with, you were saying, what works? What yeah. works? Which is a good, which in a way is a good question, but in other way, in other ways, it's not a good question because it's a bit like going to medicine and saying, mm -hmm. well, what works in medicine? Well, lots of things work, lots of things don't work, lots of things are harmful. It depends. What's the situation? What's the specific condition? Is it well diagnosed? Do you understand the problem? Then we can start talking a bit about what works and what doesn't work. And even if we find things that do work, there's always side effects. There's always trade-offs. Maybe two things work the same amount. So, again, I think it's a bit like your question about saying, is there enough evidence? Because obviously mm -hmm. that's a concern. People say, oh, there isn't enough evidence. We can't mm -hmm. do evidence-based practice. Well, you can. Similarly, people might say, oh, but it's really hard to understand what works. That can mm -hmm. be true, but that's okay because it's still just about making a more informed decision. So even if there's a range of techniques – which maybe work a little bit, work somewhat, work a bit better, work a bit worse. The point is we're trying to make a more informed decision. So rather than looking for the thing that works, we should look at what is the problem or issue or opportunity we're dealing with. So, for mm -hmm. example, this maybe isn't a good analogy. We may say, well, one thing that seems to work in medicine is a hip replacement. That works, but it's probably mm -hmm. not going to cure your headache. It's probably not going to get rid of lung cancer. It's probably not going to deal with, I don't know, some other mobility problem. So mm -hmm. even if something works, the point is it works for a particular thing in a particular context. Now, if you're, you're in that context, if it's exactly the same problem, exactly the same issue, then you can start to identify. But the most important thing is not necessarily to ask how much evidence there is or what works, is to focus on what is the thing you're dealing with. Because broadly speaking, in my experience, the greatest challenge in evidence-based practice is not trying to find a solution. The mm -hmm. greatest challenge is trying to understand what the problem is. Yeah, that yeah. Is the greatest Most challenge. of the time, it's, it's not just diagnosed properly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's equally that's equally true in HR. So in HR, people might talk about, oh, we want to improve performance. We want to. Uh, help re retain people we want to help uh, recruit better people but in all those cases in my experience typically it's very it's it's poorly defined it's poorly understood and as you said it's not very well diagnosed so what mm -hmm. people tend to do in my experience is start off with a not very well identified and not very well diagnosed issue and then they find lots and lots of solutions but the challenge there the problem there is they're finding solutions without really knowing what the problem is. So mm -hmm. maybe it's going to work, but probably it isn't or not work particularly well. Yeah. To look at is uh, recruitment and selection. The, when you go back to meta-analytic studies, you, you find that there are so many claims there. Other claims yes. to rank, uh, which ones have got high operational validity. I was reading another article recently where they were now claiming that the interview is the best, others are claiming general mental ability is the best, integrity is yeah. the best in terms of predicting. Well, what, what is the general comment around this equipment selection? Yeah, I think, I think again, it's, that it's, it's a really good example. So uh, I think from a practitioner point of view, yes, it's understandable that they want to know which is the best thing to do. So we need to recruit people, what's the best thing? And part of that is, of course, if you look at those scientific studies and the meta-analyses, they would say somewhere in them, look, it depends. It depends what you're trying to do. It depends what you're trying to measure. And even if you look at some like personality or interviews, it still might depend a bit. And often the differences between these things, even in the meta-analysis, is not that large. So you know, mm -hmm. one might be slightly better, one might be slightly worse. Maybe one doesn't seem to be good at all. But it depends on the individual practitioner's circumstances and the business and the organization. So in mm -hmm. terms of, say, recruiting people, maybe in some situations I would say, yeah, an interview might be actually quite reasonable. In other circumstances, something like a, a job, a, a sort of assessment centre might work pretty well. In other contexts, maybe something like using an intelligence test might be useful. So mm -hmm. it sort of depends 
what you're trying to do. And of course, all these ways of selecting also have their limitations as well. So again, mm -hmm. rather than looking for the best way of doing it and the idea of best practice, I would say, look, first to understand what the recruitment issue is, because they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you want to recruit a lot of people quickly. Sometimes you want to recruit people who you think will stay. Sometimes mm -hmm. what they can do now, their skills they can do now is really important. Sometimes that isn't very important. You're looking for something else. So it's about being clear about what you're actually trying to look for. And then on the basis of that, thinking, well, what's likely to help us most here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very interesting uh, analysis. The, the has been beyond the work from and there has been uh, issues to do with claims of higher productivity there. But I was reading another article saying that uh, most of the claims are coming from self-reports where you ask the employee concerns. Are you being more productive? And they say yes. Uh, and how productive are you? Maybe on a scale of one to five, they put a four, others put a two. What, what has been uh, what 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 is the evidence around the issue of whether I'm working from home gives more productivity than working from the office? Yeah, <laughs> you get you're going to get frustrated with me, Mary, because I'm going to give the same answer again. Yeah, I think okay. people want people want to debate this. They want to say working from home is good, working in the office is less good, or they want to say the opposite: working in the office is great, uh, working from home is terrible. And you've seen this. I think in many countries around the world, you've seen this polarization of it's either good or it's bad. You've also seen, certainly in the UK, in the US and amongst other countries, the desire to get people back into the office. And mm -hmm. of course, if you dig into it, uh, the best answer is it depends. So, mm -hmm. for example, it may be that employees and it depends what, what you mean by performance and it depends what's important to you in terms of employees. So it may be, for example, there might be one study that shows perhaps, you know, knowledge workers work 10 percent less well from home than they do in the office. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, if your knowledge workers work from home, they are 60 percent likely to quit. So they're more likely to stay with you. So again, there's these trade-offs here. So, and it might depend on, you know, the balance and the tasks and what you're trying to achieve. And of course, one thing the pandemic has done is it's disrupted a lot of the ways in which we think about A to HR, including working from home, because of course working from home was happening a lot before anyway. It's changed our thinking about that. And of course, both organizations and individual employees have been asking themselves good questions about, for example, meetings. Why do we have so many meetings at work? Why mm -hmm. have we had so many meetings on Zoom? Why is my day at home during the pandemic full of meetings from nine o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night? Why are we doing this? And these are good questions. These are important questions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also asked questions about why do I need to go into the office? Why is that important? And it might be. And it, and it's it, it, I would say it's pretty fairly clear i think and kind of obvious that for some kinds of collaboration some sorts of participation being physically co-located with people helps if not it's essential but simply putting people in the same room in the same office doesn't guarantee anything so i mm -hmm. think i would see these as facilitating conditions just as some things that are more likely to happen if people are co-located, there's some things it doesn't matter whether they're co-located or not. But it may mm -hmm. be important, for example, that they have a chance to socialize. So maybe it's not working together that's important. It's the being together that's important. So there's mm -hmm. all sorts of quite, I would say, nuanced issues here. And as you said, there's, there's been a tendency to, yeah, say, is it better or worse for performance? Which, again, is, is a sort of impossible question to answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then in the area of team building, um, uh, what 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 are any necessary evidence to its effectiveness? If if any, I know a lot of people have uh, talked about psychological safety or that's based on uh, some research. Uh, are you finding anything uh, coming out? To, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So in relation to team building, okay. Well, mm -hmm. I think I guess the first thing is, uh, in my understanding of this is that lots of groups at work are called teams, and they're not teams. They're just a group of people who are doing a similar job. So if you have a, a group of people in a contact centre or call centre, 
they're taking calls all day from clients or customers, but and they're all doing the same job, but they don't interact. They don't depend on each other to get the job done. They are not really teams. They're just mm-hmm. a bunch of people who do the same job. So in terms of team building as such, the key thing is, number one, is it a team mm-hmm. or is it just a bunch of people? Mm-hmm. If it is a team where there's a lot of interdependency, my understanding is in terms of team building as such, the most or, or, or enhancing the team's performance, the most important thing is that the any training or development or building you do is actually based on their work and based on the things they have to have to actually do together. So mm-hmm. sometimes, as you know, team building can take the form of, oh, let's um let's all have a day day out of the office, let's go somewhere else and let's build some Lego. Or mm-hmm. let's build a raft on a lake and see if we can make it float across or whatever it is. Now, those kinds of activities may be good for some things. Uh, mm-hmm. They might make people get to know each other, which could be good or not good, but it could be good. They may get a sense of differences between each other, which, again, broadly could be useful. But I don't categorize that necessarily as team building because they're not necessarily teams of people. And also, unless your job is to build rafts or is to build Lego as part of your work, I would say the connection between that group activity, that team activity, and what you do at work, it's, my sense is it's not likely to transfer very well to the workplace. So mm-hmm. I say team development or team building or team training, for me, has to be, I think, like any training or any development, has to sort of be connected with what it is people are actually trying to do at work. Yeah, Okay. Thank you, thank you very much for that. The, 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 in the performance management, I know most organizations struggle uh, with the performance management. Is there any evidence that shows what works or what doesn't? And uh, if any, I understand the, it depends again, but uh, is there anything to take away from the food yeah. of the food management? Yeah, so performance management, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So I think a lot of these terms in HR, they're very hard to define, <laughs> uh, which is a problem, which is a problem. So if, you, if you're if you an HR director and you're saying, oh, we want to do some performance management or we want to improve performance management, the first thing you need to do is to be able to define and say what that means. Mm-hmm. That in itself is a big challenge. Are you trying to maintain performance? Are you trying to enhance performance, improve it in some ways? In which ways are you trying to improve performance? Because performance can mean many, many different things. Are you actually just trying to prevent poor performance? So in my experience, when I've talked to HR people, often when they talk about performance management, it's much, it's much more about a concern about specific employees who, in their view, are not performing very well. In other words, maybe 80% of the staff, the workforce, they are kind of thinking they don't really need performance management. They're fine. Maybe 20% who maybe were worried about in some way. So we need to take remedial or some other kind of action. So they're all examples of what we mean by performance management. And generally, I would say my sense is about this. If you're interested in people's performance at work, one of the most important things is job design. How you mm-hmm. actually design their job in terms of the amount of control they have, the autonomy they have, the variety in their, their work their ability to draw on resources, all these traditional things we've, we've been looking at for a long time. It seems to be they're the best ways if you actually want to impact people's performance at work. Think about the way the job is designed. Unfortunately, I think HR doesn't do that maybe as much as it should, and it thinks about performance management as a series of techniques such as annual appraisals or goal setting or 360-degree feedback as means of, helping people perform better in their work rather than thinking how can we make the job design better so people can perform better in it so in terms of those traditional performance management techniques obviously it's not clear to me that the annual performance appraisal unless in particular circumstances is particularly useful goal setting people often cite goal setting as one of the most researched areas within performance performance management and, and behavior in more generally and it is it is indeed quite researched uh, but what we see in organizations i think very often is that to do goal setting well is actually a lot of work mm-hmm. so it's not that it doesn't work it's just that you need to think very carefully about the person doing the goal setting how much they really know about the job 
Are they setting goals in an appropriate way? And most importantly, it uh, depends on the, the kind of work you're doing. Can you get accurate feedback about your performance? So mm-hmm. in many jobs now, particularly knowledge work jobs, how well you're doing is often a bit unclear. It's not like, say, making something or working in some kinds of factories or manufacturing or working as a chef where you can look pretty directly at the speed and the quality of your performance. And a lot of knowledge work, it's very hard to tell. So mm-hmm. someone could set you a goal and we will set me a goal and it might be, I don't know, design a new way of doing this thing for the organization. Well, that's a pretty vague goal. What is that? How would I know how well I'm progressing on that? Supposing mm. it's going to take me six months. What does that mean? What are all the sub goals? How well does can someone really set a goal in that context? So even some of these techniques for which there is a lot of evidence and they are very effective, it doesn't mean they're going to be effective everywhere. Mm-hmm. So it comes back to the point I guess I said at the beginning for an HR manager or practitioner or director, when they talk about performance management, what are they actually trying to achieve and why are they trying to do it? What is the problem or issue or, or what is the opportunity around performance management? Bearing in mind that there's many different types of performance, bearing in mind there's a lot of variation in performance, and also bearing in mind that performance goes up and down a lot. It's very, it's not very stable. It can mm-hmm. change a lot from day to day, from week to week. So what are we trying to manage when we talk about managing performance? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that's very interesting. The other area, I don't know that there's so much research in it, but on it is uh, the area of dynamic capability. Have you done any, looked at any research around that area? This uh, is not something I know anything about, so I, I, I can't really answer any questions about that. No, no, okay. Let's go to the last, uh, the last area, which is leadership development. Yeah, uh, elite effectiveness. Uh, any any scientific evidence that uh, latest uh, data that we have? Yeah. So again, I can't. W- with all these questions, without doing a systematic review of the evidence, it's very hard for me to answer. But my mm-hmm. limited understanding, and it is limited. So if anyone wants to know about leadership development, I recommend they go on to Google Scholar and to type in leadership development evidence or leadership development systematic review or leadership development meta-analysis and try and find some scientific mm-hmm. evidence for themselves. But my limited understanding of this is that, broadly speaking, uh, I would say there isn't that much good quality evidence around about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and again, it comes down a bit to what is leadership? What does that mean? Does it mean a particular position in a hierarchy? Mm-hmm. Uh, if so, that's quite a narrow view of what leadership means. And also, does it mean it's developing to make them better at doing it? <coughs> Excuse me. Or does it mean we're developing them to help them go into those positions? Uh, it could mean lots and lots of different things. Um, if it's about trying to make leaders better, I guess there are probably skills and so on that can be learnt. But like a lot of learning, I guess some of those skills are probably best learnt on the job, as it were. It doesn't mean they can't be supported in various ways. But actually trying to give people some of these skills uh, off the job or just supporting them to get them is not necessarily that useful experience with feedback. It's probably, it's probably quite a good teacher for some of those sorts of skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other thing to bear in mind is, is if you think about the scientific evidence, is how do we judge leadership effectiveness? Mm-hmm. It's quite easy to ask people, which leaders do you like? It's quite easy to ask people which leaders do you trust. It's quite easy to, in a sense, to look at how much leaders do in the quantity of their work. The question, I guess, for lots of organisations, particularly very senior leadership, is how much difference does it make to the overall success or effectiveness, whatever that means, of the organisation as such. And also back to the point, it's a bit like talking about uh, teams and, and working from home or not at home, often we tend to see leadership as quite an individual thing. So leadership development is often around taking individuals and trying to either help them get into those positions or to help them be more effective in it. But of course, a lot of leadership is shared, it's collective, it's a group of people who are leading or making decisions. It's the followers that are a key part of this as well. So 
I think you have to be a bit careful about what is it mm. we're trying to do when we say we want to do leadership development. What are the objectives and why do we think we need to meet those objectives and how in the end might it help the organization? So in a sense, as you see, memory, my answer to a lot of your questions are pretty are the same across mm -hmm. all these domains. It starts off with saying, what is the problem? What is the issue? Or what is the opportunity? Mm -hmm. What is the evidence that you have this opportunity? What's the evidence you have this problem or issue? And if there is a good quality, you know, good quantity, of reasonable quality evidence, and you're reasonably confident, then you can start going through the same process again to find out, well, what might work? So in the case of leadership development, maybe it, you don't need to develop leaders, you need to select leaders differently. In the mm -hmm. case of team building, maybe you don't need to build uh, build teams as such, you need to maybe think about how you can get them better at doing their job, if that's the issue. In the case mm -hmm. of performance management, if you want people to perform better at work, maybe the issue opportunity there isn't about uh, managing performance in terms of individual performance. Maybe it's about changing the work environment, improving job design so people can perform better. Mm -hmm. So it's about unpacking what's going on. And typically, not just in HR, but in many fields, that people are reluctant to do that. They are much more willing to go and find a solution and intervention and try and implement it. Mm -hmm. So the what works question, well, the answer to the question of what works is, well, what are you trying to do and why? So mm -hmm. rather than what works, like, let's think about why, what you want to do, why you want to do it. So I think it's sort of switching the focus a bit away from activity in terms of implementing practices, doing stuff, finding new ideas, things you can implement, things you can do in terms of policies and practices and procedures to say, mm -hmm. let, look, we can do that. Let's stop, though, and think about what are we actually dealing with here? What's the issue? What's the opportunity? Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's very, uh, very interesting perspective. Uh, I am mean, uh, enjoying this uh, particular interview. The last part of all the interviews. Are there any specific, I know it, again it depends, are there any specific areas where there's been uh, evidence showing that uh, there may be very little value in, uh, in doing the activities in the HR that you, that you know? Yes, I think, I think one is, uh, <sighs> It, okay, so the, one is, is there little evidence, full stop, or is the evidence that's available shows they're not very effective? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a couple of areas. The, I think in terms of uh, well-being initiatives, so that's quite a popular thing in mm -hmm. some countries, so well-being initiatives, so things like mental health first aid, uh, things such as providing counselling, the APs. I would say there is a reasonable amount of evidence about those activities, uh, and they don't seem to me to be particularly, from what I can see in the evidence, particularly effective. So you can put a lot of things in place to try and help with employee well-being, but it seems that, broadly speaking, the things that are currently done don't seem to change people's well-being very much. And in part, that's for the reasons we've discussed, because people don't diagnose the problem or the issue or the opportunity. Another area, I think, that's very popular at the moment is things around diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So if we look at some of the specific practices that people want to do, such as diversity training, on, con on conscious bias training, there is a reasonable quantity of okay-ish evidence around those. And again, they don't appear to do very much. So it's not, it's not as though those things have no place uh, and they are never useful. But broadly speaking, they don't seem to be particularly effective. And a bit like in the case of well-being, I think in diversity and inclusion, one of the reasons for this is it's quite unclear often what 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 you're trying to do. What are you actually trying to achieve? What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? What's the evidence about why you should do something about this or, sh or should do something about it? What's your ethical uh, objective here? What are you trying mm -hmm. to achieve morally? What is the purpose of this? So I think there's a lot, often a lot of confusion around that. And I think one way of thinking about this, is sometimes some people call it theatre, so management theatre or HR theatre. And the mm -hmm. idea is there are some areas, probably possibly including performance management as well, mm -hmm. where you see a lot of activity. So HR will do lots of initiative, lots of uh, practices, they'll buy in lots of tools and techniques to deal with this stuff. And often it seems to me that it's being done to give the appearance 
to, mm -hmm. to as a form of theatre that something is happening. We are doing something. We are dealing with this. We are active. Look at us. We're doing stuff. It mm -hmm. is dealing with the problem. Mm -hmm. Often, if you dig under that a bit, it's not clear it is. And, 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 it, and it, I think an interesting analogy is to think about it as HR theatre, in that it is that there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of performance, there's a lot of stuff being done. But in my experience, if you use, if you ask a few simple questions about what is being done, why it's being done, it, there often aren't particularly good answers to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. I think we've come to the end of our interview. That, uh, a very interesting discussion, and I hope our uh, uh, audience will be very excited. And I hope I can call in, uh, upon you again in the future to discuss maybe other specific I'm following you on LinkedIn and Twitter. And if I pick anything that is of interest, I'll come back to you again and probably request another interview. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Robbie. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be delighted to talk to you again at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will share the link once this has been edited. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.